Hello and welcome back to A Drunk History of Middle Earth. This is a show where we take the Legendarium created by J.R. Tolkien and we have a good, simple chat about it. Some good, clean family fun. Sometimes it's a drunk person, me, trying to explain stories or events. And sometimes, if the hangover the week before was horrible, it's me breaking down the stories and concepts as if we're talking to a drunk person. I'm Chris, I'm an avid Tolkien nerd, and I'm still learning and realising how much I don't actually know. Joining me is your co-host and my lovely wife, Rebecca. Uh, do you want to say hello? Hi, I'm Rebecca, a complete novice to all things Tolkien and nerdy in general. Although um, I've now watched all three of the films, extended, extended editions, yeah. um, I can now confirm that I've been converted to the religion headed by L. Ron Tubbard. Uh, right, that's the intro sorted. Let's get into today's episode. So, uh, today we're talking about something very special. Now, I gave you, after last episode, I gave you a list of topics to choose from because we said once you'd watched all of the films, we'd go subject by subject and I wrote some of the more interesting ones down that I thought off the top of my head and you chose. So, can you uh, can you tell everyone what we've chosen to talk about today? So, I chose the creation story because I just thought that would be a... And sort of natural place to begin. So, good point, right? That would be the natural place to begin. However, often oh, regarded... It's Tolkien, so obviously it wouldn't be the natural place to begin. <laughs> no, no. Because it, he it, just changes the whole order of everything. Well, it's not that. Um, I think you're thinking of the Star Wars films there. No, it is it is the natural place to start. It is the beginning. However, it is regarded as one of the most dense parts of the lore. Like, a lot of people start to read the Silmarillion... Uh, and they'll get there and they're like, oh, fuck this. And um, that's when they just, you know, stop reading. But we'll talk about it as we go. If you've got any questions, um, we'll, we'll talk about them. But otherwise, uh, right, let's get to it. So, first thing, before the universe began, there was Eru. Eru is capital G, God, right? Yeah. Uh, when I talk about, so we talked about the Valar before, right? And I've said that they're like demigods, like mini gods, etc. Um, Sauron's boss was one of the Valar. Yeah, um, let's just not bring that many names into this yeah. episode, please. <laughs> yeah, let's not stop. So Eru, before creation, lived in a place and still lives in a place called the Timeless Halls. Yeah. And the Timeless Halls is like heaven. It exists outside of reality completely. And Eru was alone. And then from his, uh, from that, he brought forth the Ainu into creation and uh, Eru sits on his throne in the timeless halls or you know we like to generally like we'd like to imagine God sitting on a throne sometimes sometimes we like to imagine Eru sitting on a throne as well um, interesting fact is I think that Tolkien had in in his mind Eru wasn't just like capital G God of Middle Earth like the the Tolkien legendarium he is it's another word for the actual Christian God so Eru is another word for Jehovah you know, like it's the same God. Okay. If that makes sense. But yeah, so he um, he brings forth into creation the Ainu, who spring forth from his mind. So from like, if he's got a part of the mind that deals with love, that's what one of the Ainu is like a, an Ainu of love, for example. So when these Ainu are born, they don't know everything. They're not om, omniscient. Is it omniscient? Does that mean all omniscient? Knowing? Omniscient. Yeah, omniscient. They're, they're not all knowing. Um, so they, they, there's some things that are beyond them, and they have to learn, just like the, the rest of us. And I think that when we come onto it later, I think this explains why some of them could be corrupted by, uh, the, you know, evil, uh, as we'll get onto it. Um, but the Ainu were created by Elu uh, Eru Iluvatar, and they have free will. Okay. The same as the other children of Iluvatar. So, in Tolkien, only four things really have free will. The Ainu, which is the Maiar and the Valar. Elves, m humans, and dwarves. Everything else doesn't really have free will in the sense that... Or, or they, they might have free will, but they're not really counted as children of Iluvatar. Quite a murky concept. <laughs> but of the Ainu, there are two parts of them. There's the Valar, who are considered the stronger ones, and the Maya. There are 15 Valar, and there's countless Maya. Right, so at this point, I'm going to ask, what are they all called, or what is their, their sort of, I am the god of love, I am the god of... Oh, you dick. This was going to be another episode, right? But, no, okay. You want you want to play? All right, so the first ones, I'll go with the ones that uh, I can think off the top of my head. So you've got Manwe, who's the king of the winds. He's uh, the boss of, do you know, the eagles that we see? Ah, yeah. 
he is the the essentially is the king of the Valar. Um, then you've got I think his wife is called Varda, and she is the Valar who makes the stars. Yeah. Uh, after that, you've got Ulmo and Aule. Ulmo is the god of the seas, and Aule is the smith of the gods. Um, Manwe, Ulmo, and Aule are the three who really were involved in creating Middle Earth. Okay. The others just kind of did things around it. Then you've got Mandos, who um, do you remember? Uh, I mentioned that there is like a, he's he's like the Hades of Middle Earth. He's like the god of the dead. Okay, I'm just seeing like a guy with blue. Yeah, hair now. yeah, yeah. Pretty much, it's, um, it's James Woods. Um, Bless my soul, <laughs> her was on a roll. Yeah. Um, then we've got Tulkas, who is mint. He is um, he's he's almost like a Hercules figure. He's so power. He's the mightiest of the Valar. Like so, Melkor or Morgoth was the strongest and most powerful. But Tulkas is basically the hardest to the point where um, at one point he descends into the universe from the timeless halls and he laughs and his laugh causes Morgoth to run off like a little bitch like he gets scared enough from just Tulkas's laugh that he fucking runs um, so then you've got Lorien who is the master of dreams uh, I don't know a great deal about him but then we've got Oromir who rides um, the horse is it Nahara I think I'm just doing it off the top of my head who's the one of the great grandfathers of Shadowfax oh mm. So Oromir is the huntsman of the Valar and Oromir is the first one to discover the elves when they wake up. Then you've got the, the queen or the women of the Valar. You've got uh, Varda, who, funnily enough, you've got Eru, who is capital G god, Manwe, who's the king of the Valar. Varda, however, is the one that the elves worship and love amongst uh, above all others. Because, as I've mentioned before, when elves first awoke in Qvianen, the, the first thing they saw was the stars and Varda made the stars. And... I don't know if she got the light of the trees as well, or if that was Yavanna, but um, she also had something to do with the light before the sun and the moon. Then we've got Yavanna, who, um, she's the one who's married to Aule, and she's the one who had the Ents created. Ah, okay. Because her husband, Aule, had the dwarves, and she was like, fuck that, I made these trees. And then she got the Ents made, um, some marriage rivalry there. Uh, We've got Nienna, Lady of Mercy. I can't really say anything about her. Uh, Este, no idea who she is. Vera, Vanna, and Nessa. Now, Nessa, I only know a little bit about. Um, we'll do a separate episode on the Valar, but Nessa is a Welsh woman. Um, no, I'm just, oh, <laughs> that's, that's a Gavin and Stacey joke. No, Nessa is the wife of Tulkas, and they aren't already married when the world is created. Like, the, the marriage of Tulkas and Nessa is... Um, it, it's a big event. It's, it's two gods getting married. It's a massive event in uh, in the Undying Lands. So at, at one point in the earliest part of history, Morgoth predictably uses the wedding uh, where everyone gets drunk and falls asleep as a, a way to sneak in and do some horrible shit. Um, but I think Nessa is the one who's described as like so quick she can outrun a deer. Um, so she's a quick runner. But yeah, those are the Valar. The, the, oh, and then sorry, there's Melkor uh, later called Morgoth. Uh, just an all round bastard, basically. He's He's pretty much, you know, he's pretty much this version of Satan. So yeah, I mean, that's a sneak preview of the the episode we'll do on the Valar. But there's 15 Valar and there's countless Maya. Now of the Maya, Sauron's a Maya, Gandalf's a Maya, Radagast, Saruman. There's a Maya who is responsible for like coastal waters and storms. Uh, the sun and the moon are Maya. So there's just, just, just countless ones of them. Does it make sense so far? Yeah. So Eru was alone. Brought... There's three. There's three tiers so far. Yeah, Eru, Valar, and Maya. Who the Valar and the Maya, the Maya come together under the Ainu. Now Eru brings them forth and teaches them how to sing, and and he teaches and and they start to sing um, just like one by one. They they only sing in small groups all together, but Eru teaches them about music and. They, he wants them all to sing together. So he shows them a vision of what the world will be and what the universe will be like. And in that vision, the beauty and the splendor of it causes them all to start to sing together in harmony. But the, the one thing I wanted to kind of take a little a, a little, uh, a little wee left here is that J.R.R. Tolkien was good friends with C.S. Lewis. Do you know the Chronicles of Narnia guy? And, yeah, he's pretty famous. Yeah. <laughs> And have you read The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis? Of course I haven't read that because I take years to read books. So in my 27 years, I 
I've probably read about 20 books. Right. <laughs> well, Biff Chip and Kipper doesn't count, so that goes down to like six books. Right. Fantastic Mr. Fox. It's a classic. In the first book, chronologically, of the series, of the Chronicles of Narnia, it's called The Magician's Nephew, and that has magic rings in it, right? Yeah. But Aslan sings the world of Narnia into creation. His music creates, and so does uh, Eru with the Ainu ah. in the middle. So, like, they're both very close friends. So, I, I start to look into this, right? Bit of artistic license between them. Well, I, yeah, I start to look into it. I was like, so what's the connection? Like, they're both devout Christians. So, as far as I'm aware, though, Genesis doesn't start with gods like singing the world into existence. So, I was like, what the fuck is that? So, I did what any sensible person would do, and I asked Chat GPT. Just, I basically just said, like, both. C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien use music as a creation tool. What's the... And the devout Christians, like, what's the link there? Is there any history? And ChatGPT told me that C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien were both close friends and shared an interest in mythology, philosophy, and theology. And that this devout belief played a significant role in them. And that in both books, music is used for a tool of creation, uh, blah, blah, blah. But this is where it got to things that I didn't know. They, uh, like... Apparently in Christianity, there's a belief that music has the power to evoke strong emotions and express complex idea that cannot be expressed through language alone. And that Tolkien and Lewis saw music as a fundamental aspect of the divine. Is it not that sense of, um, so I get it. When I sing, I sometimes tear up without control. So is it not, is it like, or like when you hear a piece of music and it raises the hairs on your arm, that doesn't necessarily happen with just language alone. In a film, there's always music accompanying a scene. Yeah, that's true. And and then later on, even in this, this like we've got the music of the Ainu, uh, the, uh, you know, and then we get later to the tale of Beren and Luthien, where when Beren dies, uh, spoiler alert, when Beren dies, Luthien sings before Mandos, the Valar of the dead, and she sings such a beautiful song that it moves him. And he petitions Manwe to speak to Eru, and Eru Iluvatar, um, he resurrects Beren, and him and Luthien get to live a mortal life together. So, like, it, yeah, like, music can be used as powerful, but um, in my own words, this is me again, not, nothing to do with, with chat GPT. Um, is I was, once I started thinking about this, I thought, like, there is a lot of parallels, because... We talk about choirs of angels um, in the Bible, don't we? And like, there's the heavenly chorus that's described. And in the book of Revelation, you've got Gabriel blowing a horn, which is a musical instrument. And it's just, it's crazy. And like, I know you're doing a degree, obviously. I say that as if we're just acquaintances. You're my wife, I know what you're doing. <laughs> but like, uh, you're doing a degree in like classics, aren't you? Yeah. So like... Well, arts you, and humanities. Well, yeah. So far. Yeah, but like... I, I mean, in, well, your most recent one is about Christian symbology and stuff like that. So, like, what what are your thoughts on like music from a religious point of view? Because I know you've you've done you've done um, you've done whole modules on music alone, haven't you? Yeah. So music's used a lot to express many different parts of life. So even when I've looked at Gothic architecture, they discuss buildings and how they've been built as having a rhythm really yeah like there's so, a rhythm to, well, a like, rhythm in a building the ebbs and flows and areas of a building oh like um like how there's no hard corners anymore in archaeology like in uh, architecture because they're trying to like they like that's another curves, point yeah so in cathedrals the acoustics and things but oh, but just if you look at face on onto a building, you can see a rhythm and that's what's considered during architecture. But also within Christianity, there has been hymns that have been sung. Back in the day, people, many people couldn't write mm. or read. It was only influential people, people who could, monastic people, uh, clergy. So... A lot of the time, traditional beliefs were passed down through people, through song and music, because that was the only way that they could understand or remember the biblical stories. So that that's how it actually was passed down, right, because so, there wasn't that many people who could read or write. And even during the medieval period, people, many people couldn't read or write Latin, which is where a lot of the Catholic religion before the Reformation... Uh, started that turned the UK into um, a Protestant country. 
a lot of the texts were written in Latin, so mm. it was more accessible to sing. Okay, I mean, yeah. you, you can listen to a lot of different genres of music in different languages, and you can pick it up pretty quickly. You don't have to understand the language to be able to recreate the sound. Like, um, so like that Dos Origitas from Encanto. Yeah. Like, it sounds fucking stupid in English. And that Numa Numa song. You know, yeah. Like, nah, 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 you know. And I'm thinking of Last Ketchup. That's Is me. Last Ketchup in a different song or do they just sing it really quickly in English? I don't know. I said, hey. uh, anyway. That's just changed the whole tone. No, no, so anyway, no, thank you for that. That that is absolutely fascinating. Like I can understand I well, I've learned that I can understand a bit more that like music in creation and recording and expressing things is much more powerful. I dare say much more powerful than the Christian Bible of just God saying, Let there be light and there was light, you know, like um he didn't create the you know, Eru didn't create the universe that way, it was through the music. And but that story, the creation story, would have been originally passed down by word of mouth. Mm. Would it? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. And word of mouth and, you know, song and poetry and... Because the people didn't write things down. It's all been word of mouth through history, apart from when people developed the technology and had access to tools and equipment that you could use to write. Parchment and... Papyri, uh, papyri and stuff. Oh, okay, so. cool. So, back in uh, that, after a little detour into the real world, so thank you, Becca. Um, that was class. Um, the, the, yeah, Eru taught the Ainu how to sing, and he showed them a vision of what they could achieve, and from that vision, they all started to sing together instead of just by themselves. And they started to sing, and the music became a choir that reached from the abyss to the firmament which um, is a way of saying it, it spanned the entire of the timeless halls. So you have the timeless halls and the void and uh, this music went outwards and encompassed it all. And this, and this is a word I've been practicing all week that I'm going to try and teach you now. This music is called the Ainu Lindale. Can you say that word? Because it... Ainu Lindale. <laughs> Ainu Lindale. Ainu Lindale. Ainu Lindale. It... Ainu Lindale. I think it literally just means the music of the Ainu. Uh, oh, the Ainu, sorry. And uh, the Ainu Lindale is what's called, that's what the Song of Creation is called. And for years, fucking secretly dyslexic Chris has read it as Ayundale. I, I, no, I think in episodes I've referred to it as the Ayundale. I was reading the Silmarillion the other day and I was writing notes on that and I was like, oh wait, it's got Ainu right at the beginning of it and there's an L. Like, I was just like, what the fuck? I've just not read this properly so, at all. So, I've got a massive question. Yeah, you got a raging question. So I find it hard listening to you talking about Tolkien's works mm -hmm. because I forget that it's not reality. So my question is, where has all this information come from? Is this from Tolkien or is this from his son? Or is this like he just kind of shared this, what he believed? and Or has this been made up by people who've studied him over time and been like, Ah, uh, right, okay, we conclude. No. This. So, um, these things that you're getting at could be their own episode. So, I'll cover this quickly and we'll move on. I'm just doing a fact check. No, no, absolutely. Tolkien wrote all of this over many years from the earliest writings were just after the summer of 19, 1917 or something, all the way through. To him dying in the 70s, right? And he'd set out, and, and what he calls it, it's not mythology or not a story, he calls it just a fictional history. Uh, and that's what it is. It's it's a fictional history of his world. And he wrote all this, the creation story. Um, and, I've, well, I've been reading up on it recently because I was always under the impression that he wrote it kind of like as a alternative mythology for England that we never really had, like a mythology of the Elder Days. However, recent readings have led me to believe that might not be the case and that he's claimed not to do that. But basically, this is all his work. All of this, uh, all of these elements are his work that he wrote. He didn't, it, it was a story. He knew it was a story, but he wanted to build a world. And I think I said in the first episode we did when we watched Fellowship of the Ring, he was a philologist and it has been said that Tolkien built an entire world for his languages to play in. And that's why it's so detailed, is it's the language elements of it. So you've got the Ainu Lindale, which means, you know, music of the, the Ainu. Um, you've got the Ainu, which is then split into the Maya and the Valar. So it's Saruman, 
means old. I think it's like old man in old English language. So, and then you've got the hobbits and the Rohirrim who've got shared languages because they originated from the same area of. Um, can you see on that map there the the top of Mirkwood? Yeah. That's a so that whole area of Mirkwood's called Rovanion, and hobbits moved west over the mountains. Whereas the people who would become the Rohirrim came down to Rohan, which is at that point called the Kalinardon, and they were yeah. invited there by Numenor. But when Merry gets to Rohan, he realises they've got shared words, so they look at their history together. So I'm saying that very quickly, just to say that he came up with a history in these languages for them all to play together. So it, it seems bizarre to me and you that someone would put that much effort in, but he did, and he was writing this throughout his whole life. So yeah, the fact check is that this is all Tolkien's writing. But don't get me wrong, he didn't. He wasn't just a fucking nut job. He didn't believe it was real. It was just a world he developed. And was he Catholic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Big time. that also the the blah, 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 what they called again the second tier the I know right so the Valar are, yeah so they those body of people then may act as like saints within the Catholic faith. Yeah, so... So you've got, like, the mm. St. Francis of Assisi and people like that. They've all got different things that they are known for, like piety and, you know, love of animals. And so it has the same sort of yeah, yeah, vibes. Yeah, so he says um, in, in the foreword to Lord of the Rings, Tolkien says, I dislike allegory in all of its forms. Um, and that's, like, fair enough, but... I think you can't get away from it. Like you've got you've got Mel- Melkor slash Morgoth, who is a standing for Satan. You've got Eru Iluvatar, who is an actual god, who is actual god. So you know you've got the Valar, who are like demigods slash angels slash archangels, and then you've got the Maya, who are like also lesser tiers of angels as well. Like um, you know you go from your archangels to like your cherubim uh, and stuff like that, and then you've got um, people who breed. With, so there's Melian, who is a, a Maya who I think she mates with King Thingol. Uh, is it Thingol or... So anyway, one of the elf kings. And from that comes Luthien. So if we're sticking with the Catholic and, and the Christianity, um, technically Luthien, being the daughter of an angel, would be classed as like a Nephilim. Do you know, like um, the, the offspring of a man and yeah. an angel. Um, but again, fascinating as it is, and I would love to deep dive into this more, uh, just the whole background outside of it. I'd love to look into his, like, his history of Christianity. Well, we've still got enough to deal with with this fucking creation story. So, so what day is this? Two or something? This is this is before this is day zero. <laughs> um, so we've got the Ainu Lindale, which is the song of creation, and they all start to sing together. And Eru encouraged all of the Ainu to weave their own themes into it. He gave them creativity, and he said, "Put your own ideas into it. Put your own flair. We're going to build this world together." Uh, now, enter stage. Melkor. Melkor is the most powerful of the Valar. In so, do you know when I mentioned earlier that um, they all came from Eru's mind, and that if you were the part of his mind that knew about love, you'd sing about love and you'd know about love, but you'd have to learn about other things. Yeah. Melkor was different in that he knew about everything. He was like a lesser. He was the most powerful of the Valar, and he knew about all parts of Eru's creation instead of just his one thing, and then he'd grow. So he was the most powerful of the Valar. And he spent a lot of time outside of the timeless halls in the void, which is outside of creation. And he began to wander by himself, which none of the other Ainu did. And he was looking for the flame imperishable, which is what allows Eru to truly create life. But he couldn't find it. But because he wandered out there so much by himself, his thoughts began to be strange. He began to not think like the other Ainu. And that shows itself because um, he started to sing his own song in the, the, the first theme. This was called the th- first theme. And everyone began to sing and create the world. And Melkor sang, but his song clashed with the theme. And it started to discord things and it started to, to, to break things up. Um, and, he, and he did this in the way because he wasn't trying to create like everybody else. He was trying to give himself more power through the song of creation. And Eru smiled surprisingly at this and he held up his left hand to silence him and one, I wish that worked with all I, I was yeah I was writing this and I was like fuck I wish I could do that just hold up a hand and they stop <laughs> but Eru then began a second theme and this time Manwe 
who was the king of the Valar, led a theme, he led the song in contesting Melkor's, who had started to fuck with it again, right? This time, Melkor won, and some I know were so upset that they stopped singing altogether. This wasn't part of the plan. They stopped creating. They, they were being really messed with. Um, this time, Eru was a bit pissed off, and he held his hand up, his right hand, and the music for the, the second theme stopped before. But this time, the second theme started again. And a third theme also started at the same time. Now, the second theme that Melkor had fucked with so badly carried on. It was, like, really brash. And, like, do you know when, like, our kid... Do you know when you were stretching in the kitchen the other day? And the kid started, like, um, banging the pans near your head and making, like, really loud noises? Yeah. That was exactly what Melkor was doing. So uh, you were, you're, if you were like Eru, you were just chilling, trying to stretch. And Melkor was our kid stood above you, just banging the pans together. So that's what the second theme became. It became like a just ah, clashing. But a third theme had started that Eru, and this one was really sad. And because of the sadness, it was beautiful. Like um, if you imagine, like well, not imagine, but like I've seen it with you, like. There's been times where you've had like you've been really dressed up nicely and we've gone out somewhere and then like maybe you've been a bit upset and you've had like a tear and a bit of mascara runs. And because of that, you be like it's almost like all the more beautiful. Like you're that you're really beautiful, but because of the sadness it makes you slightly more beautiful. If that makes sense. Am I thinking of sexy with smudged mascara? Not... <laughs> anyway, it was either sad or sexy. Um but because the third theme wasn't loud and brash, it was sad and beautiful, it wove the second theme into its own tune so that Melkor couldn't overpower it because anything he tried just kept getting woven into the third theme, right? Turning the pans into something. In, yeah, so... Nice. So like... um, Melkor was banging the pans. Yeah. And instead of going, stop it! Ah, um, you were like, yeah, go for it, right? Let's what, yeah, do a rhythm with exactly. the pans what instead. Exactly, what, what Eru started doing... If it being was, random. Instead of telling Melkor to stop again, what, Mel, uh, what he did was he listened for the beat and then he started clapping his hands along with it and stamping his feet and then just like doing a little blues uh, like scatty, scatty thing. And that's the key to Parrington. Yeah, just uh, just use the momentum against them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was fun that night actually. That was really fun. Like we were all just we had a, that was when we had that little like one minute dance party. Yeah. And we turned all the lights off and like we just listened to music and she didn't know what to do until she started dancing with us. <laughs> anyway, but eventually Eru stood. He raised both his arms and sang a single note. And this note was apparently uh, higher than the firmament and deeper than the abyss. So it, 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 out, it encompassed the music as a whole. And again, so the whole of creation was there. And the music stopped completely. Now here I'm going to take another small detour into uh, H.P. Lovecraft, who I'm a big fan of, right? In Lovecraft, um, so we, we've got C.S. Lewis with the music of creation. We've got J.R. Tolkien. Um, funnily enough, do you know what J.R. Tolkien stands for? Jeremy Rain Tolkien. Uh, no, it's Jolkin Rolkin Rolkin Tolkien. His parents <laughs> hated it. Um, but J.R. Tolkien has has music of creation as well. Now, in H.P. Lovecraft, now I, I don't think H.P. Lovecraft himself wrote this, but I think it was someone who added to the mythos. There is a being called Azathoth who is uh, regarded as a blind idiot god. And Azathoth sleeps at the centre of all creation. And there are uh, guardians of Azathoth that sit around him playing pipes or sit around it. Blowing pipes, uh, banging drums and playing horrible music to keep it asleep. Because if Azathoth awakes, all of creation ends. We are a dream in, in, in that mythos. We are a dream being had by a, 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 a idiot god. That sounds beautiful. It is fucking terrible. And it turns out that we are guardians of Azathoth for our daughter because we play music to keep her asleep as well. <laughs> because if she wakes up, our life feels like it's ended sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking two o'clock in the morning, she's screeching. But after the music, I, uh, Eru shows the eye I knew a vision of the world that they were making and what was to come. But um, he stops it before the end. So nobody, and he takes the vision away, and nobody but Eru Iluvatar knows how things will end. But in this third theme, the children of Iluvatar were woven into it. However, none of the uh, the Aino dared to contribute to it. None of them dared mess with it. So Eru alone sang in the themes of what would become men and elves. Um, and that's how we were created is through the music as well. We were part of the third theme, uh, and so were the elves. 
Um, Can you not say we? Because then it's making it reality again, <laughs> and I'm, I'm forgetting what our creation story actually is. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, Eru didn't let them, didn't let the uh, the Aino or Ainu see how things would end, and instead he said, "Ea, let these things be," and that's pronounced E A. It's not like just the Geordian me saying Ea. No, it was uh, it's Ea. Let these things be, and the name of the universe that Middle Earth exists in. Or our universe, if it's a history, is Aya, and it's a, it's an E with those little two dots above it, I think. So I fuck knows how you pronounce that, but Aya is, is how I say it. And that was how our universe was born. That was the first music, and the story goes that at the end of all things, Eru will start a second music, and in that second music, men, as in the race of man, will contribute as well. We will sing uh, the second world, and we will sing a second universe into existence along with the Aino. And uh, the Ainu here, once AR was created, were given a choice. You can stay in the Timeless Halls with Eru, or you can descend into AR. But if you descend into AR, you are there until the end. You cannot come back. And the first to go into AR were the Valar. And they descended, and eventually they would take on the forms of things similar to the children of Iluvatar. They'd look like men and elves. But obviously in much greater stature uh, and, and much greater feet. But the Valar's mission was to make the world uh, that would become known as Arda, which is like Earth, essentially. They Their mission was to make the world ready for the coming of the children of the Iluvatar. On, originally, only men and elves. Remember, dwarves were added uh, by Aule, and he was going to destroy them, but Eru essentially adopted dwarves and said, look, they can be, they can stay and they can have free will, but they're going to have to go back to sleep until the elves wake up. Yeah, right? I remember. Yeah. So it, it was a lasting choice and the, everyone had their jobs when they went through. And also, unfortunately for everyone, Melkor decided to come through as well. So if we're lucky and we go in a chronological order, uh, next episode perhaps we can discuss the creation of Arda. Because surprise, surprise, Melkor fucks that up as well. He fights every step of the way with Manwe, Ulmo and Aule. Who are trying to make the mountains, the fucking trees, the, the the oceans, and because of that, the way the world is originally designed, which is perfectly symmetrical, Melkor fucks it up. Everywhere they make a valley, he pulls it up into a mountain. Um, he's just he's our kid, uh, and I don't mean to say our dog is <laughs> I know exactly how it comes across, but it's exactly like a kid running around when you've tidied up, pulling all the stuff back out again just for the sake of it, uh, and that's what Melkor does. And that, 40 minutes in, pretty much, that is the creation of the universe of uh, where the Lord of the Rings takes place. How did that feel for your first pass at that story? Because I've tried to explain bits and pieces to you. I didn't think that was bad. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I feel like I get it. The first bit is completely sunk in. This second bit about them going to Earth is sinking in. I just try. I'm trying to make it. But I told you, like the film going to my brain, not as truth for my own story as a human being on planet Earth. It's a fucking but fictional story, me. Rebecca. Why would it? Why would you think of it? Because like Because you keep referring to it as we. We will sing <laughs> the next song. You know what I mean. So it's. No, I'm hoping when I die, I go to Valhalla. I've chosen my afterlife. I just wish for a, a black space, quietness. We tried that. We went to a sensory deprivation thing and you fell asleep. Yeah, it was fantastic. Anyway, <sighs> anyway. Um, yeah, that, that made sense to me a lot. Right, okay, quick knowledge check then. Speed run it for me. Creation to entering into the universe. So, Eru is God. Yeah. Um, the Ainu and the Valar. Ainu is the Valar and the Maya, but yeah. Right. I knew was the second tier, and the Valar and the M- M- Maya a part of that tier. Yeah. The Maya hierarchically is that the word? Hierarchically, I guess. Yeah, so it's a word. Um, are above the Valar, or the way around. Other way around. Yeah. Oh, jeez. No, no, you're doing good. And they've all got different. Things that they specialise in, mm-hmm. but they have to learn the rest. Yes. So if you specialise in, you know, magical creatures 
at Hogwarts, you need to learn potion making. <laughs> we almost went a full episode without talking about Harry Potter. <laughs> so, but there's one guy, Melkor, mm. who just knows everything. Mm-hmm. Like he's the naturally gifted and talented child in the yeah. class. And typical true to form. Fucks it up. Yeah. Because he doesn't want to work hard. Yeah, exactly. So, Eru wants everyone to sing this beautiful song, puts a vision in the head of like, if you sing for me this beautiful song, this is what we can make. So they start singing their tunes, beating them beats out, and then Melkor is just like, this is really boring, like I find this super easy, like I'm going to go off the path. So he decides to go have a little walk around into the darkness and then starts his own tune. He's like, this is, like, I fancy death metal. Mm -hmm. I'm not into this romantic, chill vibe. So he starts his tune and then Eru's like, no thanks, stop. Yeah, left hand stop. Left hand stop. So then he stops his tune and then the other, this other guy can't remember his name. Manway. Starts another tune. I think Eru starts the second theme, but Manway leads it. Yeah, you're right. And um, Melkor's like, going ape. I'm trying not to swear. Why? I know I said Glug Clean Family Fun, but I was fucking around. Right, okay. So, um, he's going ape shit, like, trying to fight against it. And at this point, Eru's like, no, right hand, stop. And yeah. then... Miss Rachel, stop. Yeah. Take a deep breath. Make good choices. Yeah, and then then does like another song just magically appear? Well, Eru, no, Eru. Uh, Do as, they start all start up? Again? Yeah, Melkor won't shut up the second time. So they all so start just, up again. So Eru's like, everyone but that fucker sing. Uh, well, and and, and it's really cronies. sad because they're like, oh, like they're the really goody two shoes people in the class, and they're like, <laughs> oh, this there's always one that ruins it. Yeah. So they're really sad because um, they won't get another marble in there their jar and get golden time right um so their song is a sad song um and that stops him from being able to kind of mess about because he's then like fighting against it there's resistance like now there's proper resistance so instead of fighting him they just incorporate it into their music yeah um and that then creates the universe yeah um... um they all stop Mm-hmm. by Eru doing his last his crescendo and that's the universe created then he gives them a choice right do you fancy popping down or do you want to stay with me mm-hmm. and the Valar decide to shuffle on down there and start creating stuff for it to become habitable for the people and then or the beings and then uh, Melkor decides to join them because he's like obviously rule breaker he's like ah I'm going to go down there as well and make it as hard as possible. And that's that's that. Absolutely. And that was the summary from Rebecca. I, I'm going to kiss you so hard when we stop recording. That was mint. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so I thought a little uh, fun fact to finish off. Some of that might make you smile about Middle Earth that you don't know. Bears are really fucking friendly in Middle Earth. Aww. So do you know uh, in The Hobbit there's Bjorn who can turn into a bear? He's not just... Do you know where all the hobbit, like all the dwarves in the hobbit stay his house and he yeah. turns into a bear? Anyway, turns out actual regular bears are much nicer than him anyway. Um, there are bears that come to visit humans as friends and like dance with them and like eat together and stuff. Aww. And it's incredibly rare to hear a human at one point in like Middle Earth history being killed by a bear because they're so like friendly with Did humans. Do they eat honey? Yeah, yeah, they do, yeah. So they're like Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, pretty much. But um, So like, there's only bears that I've ever hurt humans, as far as I'm aware, are ones who've been like protecting their young or in like a mating kind of frenzy. Um, I, I'm not. That's not to say someone's been fucked to death by a bear, but it's just like, um, <laughs> John, John, like, like when they're in heat. Sorry, they could be more aggressive. Yeah. But yeah, I was really. It's in a book called like the Nature of Middle Earth. And apparently, did he write that as I, well? No, it's it's from collections of his writings. Right. Okay. But yeah, I'm pretty sure that bears um super friendly in Middle Earth. So yeah, dear listener, with that nice little heartwarming tidbit, we're going to end uh, the creation story. Or well. The, the creation of the universe story. We've still got a long way to go before we get to the Shire. Um, 
but I'd like to say thank you. Uh, going forward, we can probably expect episodes to be about this long, do you reckon? Because yes. it, it, this is the more complicated one, so you know, I think we sound handled it. But as always, we hope you have a, a lovely day, and I'm going to say goodbye from me, Chris. And goodbye from Rebecca. Okay, have a good one.